I made a new friend. I said, yeah? Who is it? Aaliyah. Which one is she? I asked, looking at the front of the school. The one in the red shirt. I looked around. There was only one child in a red shirt. And she had brown skin and a niqab covering her head. My daughter had not seen or perhaps thought that the color of her skin was part of the description. I can't claim that. I see a person's skin color. I consciously catch myself. I've grown older and wiser and all of those things and more liberal and everything else, and and I don't let it affect how I see them. But if I was to say to you, I don't notice this person's skin color right off, I'm sorry, I'd be lying. And I'm not proud of that. When people of color did enter my life, they were strange, unfamiliar. They were other. I wasn't the first person to walk a room across the room and start up a conversation. I wasn't the one who reached out and began to build a bridge. It wasn't that this segregation was even a conscious act on my part. It just, it just sort of happened. I didn't know enough. It didn't occur to me that this might be my obligation to make someone at that time always from another country feel welcome in our presence. And I'm sorry about that. But it was simple ignorance more than deliberate racism, I think. And I suppose on reflection that I was expecting them to fit in with me and did not feel that obligation to make the first move. Unconsciously, I understood that mine was the dominant culture and the task of fitting in belonged to them, if such a task there be. And yeah, that is racism. Maybe not the hateful kind, but it's racism nonetheless. And those of you who grew up in Canada or North America, in very broad terms, have a way of seeing the world. It's the water in which we swim. We understand how Canada operates, how government works more or less, how our legal system operates, how our medical system operates. It's not something we have to think about all that much. And it's the way of things, right? The way we do things is the way of things. We don't barter in stores. We line up for buses in a certain polite English way. Most of us do not fear the police, most of us, and so on and so on and so on. But people who come to our country or who are the first generation of people who came to our country, they're expected to fit into our world. They have to change, not us. And that is white privilege. And it's something people have begun finally to challenge. Last week, Bill Lee posted an article from a black woman, Lori Lakin Hutcherson, to the UCE Facebook page. She was asked to define white privilege for a white friend. She had many examples, I think there were eight, but I was struck by the subtlety of this one. She wrote, In my freshman college tutorial, our small group of four or five were assigned to read Thoreau, Emerson, Malcolm X, Joseph Conrad, Dreeser, etc. And when it was the week to discuss the autobiography of Malcolm X, one white boy boldly claimed he couldn't even get through it because he couldn't relate and didn't think he should be forced to read it. I don't remember the words I said, but I still remember the feeling. I know I said something like, my whole life I had to read things that don't have anything to do with me or that I can relate to. But I find a way anyway, because that's what learning is about. Trying to understand other people's perspectives. And the point here is the canon of literature studied in the United States, this is still her words, as well as the majority of television and movies have focused primarily on the works or the achievements of white men. So if you've never experienced or considered how damaging it is, was, could be to grow up without myriad role models and images in school that reflect you in your required reading material or in mainstream media, you have white privilege. End quote. And that is racism. It's systemic racism. 
I'd like to think I've come a long way since my childhood lack of awareness. When I was traveling for the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists, I was exposed to many cultures and races, some of them for the first time. And on several occasions, I was the minority in the room, sometimes the only Caucasian face. And I was keenly aware that this world, whether African or Filipino or Indian, operated very differently from the one that I knew. All of the expectations I had had to go out the window, and I had to learn how to live in that milieu for a week, two weeks, three weeks. It was a glimpse into the kinds of challenges that non-white people face in Western nations, and I hope it made me more aware. I learned a lot from that international work. I, well, actually, a lot of white folks in that group, so I'll say we, learned that we were using a very traditional Western model of operations, good old Robert's Rules of Order. And a shining example comes from our friend, Reverend Fulgence, who was here a couple of weeks ago raising money for Francophone Ministries. Fulgence was still living in Burundi at that time. He was just barely into his 30s. He spoke at least three different African languages and French. He had but a few words of English back then. But English was the common language of the council. At a formal business meeting, there was some heated discussion about some motion that had been put on the floor and after a lot of back and forth was moved to the table. And confused, he leaned over to a mutual friend and asked, what are they talking about? I don't see anything on the floor and I didn't see anybody pick it up and put it on the table either. (laughs) He helped our organization to confront are unconsidered structural racism. And the council now conducts its meetings far differently, focusing on consensus-building discussions with an absolute minimum of procedural detail. I stopped being a child a long time ago, but my grasp of racism took a lot longer to mature, and I'm still growing. I used to think that racism was about slavery and residential schools, once I learned they existed, about lynching and ghettos and mean-spirited jokes. You know, big and notable actions that we can easily condemn and forget by saying, well, I'm not part of that. But racism is more complex. So let's take a look at its structure, at its history. I read an article by Dr. Charlotte Reading who pointed out that while dislike and hatred between social groups, tribes, and nations has always been with us since Neanderthals in the caves, the idea of race has not. She says, and this is a long passage, race is a relatively recent concept within Western societies. In Europe, until the latter part of the 1600s, identity was primarily defined by one's religion and language. The concept of race as a category of identity did not emerge until Europeans began to colonize other continents. In 1684, Francois Bernier published the first classifications of humans into distinct races, followed by a 1735 publication by Carolus Linnaeus, the famous physician, which further classified people based on continental differences. So he arbitrarily classified Europeans as cheerful, Asiatics as melancholy, Americans as aggressive, and Africans as sluggish. During this time, scientists became increasingly interested in looking for differences between groups who were now defined as separate races. These investigations produced an official ideology or worldview of race. And according to this ideology, racial categories are exclusive. They arise from nature, and they are enduring. Authors, including Thomas Jefferson, the almost Unitarian, promoted a more oppressive ideology in which Caucasians were generally viewed as superior to all other races, and particularly to people who had been classified as Negroid or American Indian. It's interesting to note that 18th century naturalists who were formulating characteristics of various races relied primarily on colonists' subjective descriptions of indigenous peoples, who were often referred to as inferior savages. She continues, 
By the 1800s, the term race had become commonplace, and for the first time in human history, racial classifications were used to create and maintain discriminatory hierarchies. Now today, scientists have confirmed that there is no biological basis for what we refer to as races. No biological basis. Basis. In fact, she says, genetic researchers have discovered that among modern humans, 85% of our genetic variation occurs between individuals, but only 5% between races that live on the same continent, and 10% if you look at people who live on different continents. As Graves points out, she says, some animals have more genetic variation than humans. There is more variation within one tribe of wild chimpanzees than has been observed within all existing humans. In fact, one researcher suggests, she's ending now, that the idea of race and its persistence as a social category is only given meaning in a social order structured by forms of inequality, economic, political, and cultural that are organized to a significant degree by race. So the bottom line, this is me now, so the bottom line is that race is a false construct designed and perpetuated only to create divisions, social hierarchy, and to reinforce privilege. This is nothing new. As Dr. Reading noted, before race, we hated on the basis of religion. We also had the idea of noble birth and royalty as a means of separating the privileged from the mass. In times of war, we have state-sponsored propaganda which deliberately dehumanizes the enemy even when they look just like us. And if you want an example, go back and look at the propaganda of World War I and World War II on both sides of that war. These days, we have the excesses of capitalism. And some at the top of that pile use all of those tools, racism, political fears about terrorism, threat of economic decline and mass destruction as ways to divide the population and perpetuate their privilege and their power. Racism is nothing more than a tool of division, one more way to define otherness. And otherness is the shield and buckler of human insecurity. We define people as other because we're scared of losing something. We won't or can't see us as being enough. We want more. We want more safety. We want more security. We want more wealth and power. We want fill in the blank. I'm sure you can. And when we don't have it, Many of us feel less than our complete selves. And so we want to reach out and blame somebody else for keeping us away or wanting to steal what we have. And the current U.S. president has constructed his entire worldview around the exploitation of this insecurity. Racism is a terrible thing. It is a terrible thing in any time and in any place, but right now it is one of the dominant means for exploiting otherness. The dominant means of stirring our fears and stirring our insecurities. The dominant means of creating or reinforcing privilege, and not only in white culture. Every group dismisses some other group using race, ethnicity, language, religion, whatever. Racism is at the very least unfairly exclusionary and at its worst downright dangerous and violent. But it is only one way we let our fears define the others who frighten us and who allow us to feel less than okay. Sadly, we can have all kinds of government anti racism programs, but until each one of us decides that we are enough as we are. Dividing the world into us and them will continue. Next week, I want to look at the way our principles call us to challenge otherness. All of them confront us to challenge otherness. This is our mission as Unitarians. Amen.
The words for meditation today come from Langston Hughes. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. Our chalice is extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and the hearts and the souls of each one of you. So carry it with you when you leave this place and share it with those you know, with those you love, and most especially with those you've yet to meet. It is our tradition to join hands and sing Carry the Flame of Peace and Love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until